And now, afternoon theatre. We present Wendy Hiller as the Dowager Empress Mary, Rosalind Shanks as Anna Brun, and Alan Wheatley as Prince Boonin, in Anastasia by Marcel Moret. Translated by Guy Bolton and adapted for radio by John Scotney. Berlin, winter 1932. Chenov? Oh, who is it? It's all right. It's not one of Stalin's agents, nor one of our subscribers. It's only me. Ah, Petrovsky. <laughs> the prince isn't at home? No, I've been waiting half an hour. I've been typing up our accounts. The prince has been horribly extravagant. He's been living the way he did 15 years ago, before the revolution. <laughs> You'd never think from this. He'd spent most of the last ten years as a taxi driver. I know. Why on earth did he have to rent this huge house? <laughs> Prices here in Berlin are astronomical. Oh, the house is nothing. It's what goes with it. The women, the champagne suppers. <laughs> He's a Russian. I'm a Russian too, but I live in one room in a cheap hotel. This is our headquarters. A good address has value. It won't help us much in our present emergency. Emergency? What do you mean? We're in trouble. That's why the prince asked us to meet him here tonight. What sort of trouble? I don't know the details. He naturally couldn't tell me much on the phone, but I take it... Two or three of our subscribers have got together and compared notes. I suppose we should have expected something of the kind. It's over four months since we sent out our first circular, and while we've been keeping up our appeals and taking in their money, we've made no serious effort to find the lady who is the essential element in our enterprise. That isn't true. I, I've made inquiries all over Berlin. I've seen a dozen or more Anna Bruns. It's one of the troubles... The name is such a common one. Uh, do you think there ever was an Anna Brune who told those nuns that she was the Tsar's daughter? You think His Excellency lied to us? His Excellency. You say it with reverence, in spite of all we know about Prince Bunin. <laughs> You're a snob, Petrovsky. But his story didn't seem the sort of thing a man would make up. Driving those people out to that hospital in Spandau in his taxi and one of the nuns asked him... Exactly. Five months ago, he was driving a taxi. Now he sports a car and a chauffeur. No doubt some of our subscribers have seen him lording about in it. And the actual moment was so propitious. This Anna Brun, whose likeness to the princess he claims is so extraordinary, she appears just as the rumours of Anastasia's escape were flying about among the Russian exiles. Uh, her disappearance after no one but the prince has seen her huh, wasn't quite so fortunate. What on earth made her run away? Why did we ever get into it? <laughs> you especially. I've always been a crazy fellow, an artist, a dreamer. But you're a hard-headed banker, or were in the old days. I needed the money. It's as simple as that. Ah, so that story was true. What story? The prince told me. He said you'd been caught helping yourself from the cash drawer of that restaurant where you worked as a waiter. That's a lie. <laughs> Don't be offended. I'm not posing as your model superior. <laughs> we're just a couple of rats, Chanoff. Fifteen years ago, the Bolsheviks turned us out of our nice, comfortable granary, so now we have to snatch our crusts as best we may. Listen, there's the front door. The prince is here. He said nine. It's nearly eleven. The others said, uh, what others? It's Drevenitz. Oh, prince Bunin is not here. No, uh, not yet. So, you are the other two in this game, are you? Game? Which one are you? Uh, my name is Chernoff, Councillor. No, you know me, do you? By sight, Councillor. And it's true, is it? Bunin is not here? No, but we're expecting him at any moment. I was expecting him also for several hours. My guess is he's taken to his heels. Run away, you mean? You're the third one, are you? Uh, Petrovsky, Councillor. <laughs> yes, yeah. Petrovsky. I mean run away. Why should he? I can give you one simple answer. Recently, a small committee of us advertised for the names of your investors and the amount subscribed, and we discovered just how much money you'd obtained. Uh, our expenses have been very heavy. Her Highness was in hiding in Bucharest. We had great difficulties. Bucharest? Really? Mm, uh, papers had to be obtained, officials bribed. And the medical expenses, doctors, nurses, private ambulances. Oh, yes, that was all enumerated in your appeals. 
The Princess Anastasia was in a coma. A coma? Uh, yes, for a time, quite definitely. Is it any wonder, after all, she'd gone through? The wounds suffered at the hand of Yorovsky's execution squad, the hardships endured in all those months of journeying from Siberia. Yes, all this was fully dealt with in your last prospectus, if I may so call it. Mm. Her Highness's recovery is oh, a painfully slow process. So it seems. And in the meanwhile, her doctors have insisted on isolation, rest, absolute quiet. We wish to see her doctors. Well, surely Prince Bunin has told you. Her Highness is in a private sanatorium in Switzerland. I, for one, am ready to make the journey immediately. Well, Gentlemen, we, that is the committee I have formed, will give you one week to produce this lady. After that, we go to the police. One week? One week, and then we will... Councillor Drevenitz. Good evening, honoured sir. This is an unexpected pleasure. Prince Boonin... So you are here. Why did you not send me word that you were not keeping your appointment? I hadn't realised it was a matter of concern. I... So oh, I do now. Count Lansdorff delayed me. It's the money he's after, the share our letter promised him of the Tsar's millions. If the Princess Anastasia really existed, she could command not only our money, but our lives. So you've already made up your mind that the Princess is a myth, hmm? Very well. You shall see. You shall see. We shall be at your disposal a week from today. <sighs> One week. Makes you sweat, does it? It's easy to see you've never been shot at, Chernoff. Conspiracy to defraud. <laughs> well, what is the penalty? How long? Wait. We're not beaten yet. What? What? What would you say to a miracle, hmm? What do you mean? I've found her, gentlemen. At the eleventh hour, I've found her. Found her? Not Anna Brun. Of course. The same Anna Brun on whose claim to being the Tsar's daughter, all this business is based. Where did you find her? Where do you think? On one of the bridges that cross the Landfair Canal... I had a notion she might be thinking of throwing herself into it. Why? Oh, ill, out of work, half-starved. And what is your opinion now that you've seen her again? Of her claim to be Anastasia, I mean? Precisely what it was before. She's no more the Tsar's daughter than I am one of the murdered dukes. If she's as unconvincing as that, what makes you think Drevenitz and his friends will accept her? Don't worry. When they see her... She'll be very different from the way she appears now. Believe me, it was not for nothing that those hospital nuns had faith in her story. Has she anything to back it up with? Any papers or family heirlooms? Nothing. And she's not backing it up. She says now that the story was a lot of nonsense. What? That she isn't the Tsar's daughter. But good God, if she denies it herself, what possible... She'll come back to it. She's a bit, what shall we say, touched. Hmm? Ah. Mm. Her story today is that she doesn't know who she is. And I dare say that's true. An amnesiac. Oh, that certainly. And a pray at times to all sorts of bizarre fancies. But don't worry. She's all the more ready to receive impressions. I'll make her play our little charade. And if she can't? Well, if she makes a mess of it, we can still point a finger at her... She is the guilty one. We are only her poor innocent dupes, whom she deceived with her lies. But now, comrades, if that term doesn't grate too unpleasantly on your white Russian ears, what do you say? Shall we have her in? You don't mean to say she's here. Indeed she is. Sergei, bring the lady up. Yes, Your Excellency. Now, let me caution you. Don't speak to her in Russian. What? She says she doesn't understand it. What? But that makes it impossible. Oh, it's a lie. She has a definite Slav accent. But don't worry. I'll break her down. Yes. I remember hearing tales of your methods of breaking people down. But Berlin isn't Russia until 1932, isn't 1916, Bunin? Bring her in, Sergei. Your Excellency, Fräulein Brun. 
Go on in, Fräulein. Go on. Yes, come in, Fräulein. <laughs> Take a seat. Glass of vodka. Thank you. Sergei. <clears throat> That'll be all, Sergei. Yes, Your Excellency. Now, these are the gentlemen I spoke of. I'm putting you in their hands. They're going to examine you. They're doctors. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't have to undress. Just allow them to look at you. Oh, is that all? May I smoke? Mm. Here. Help yourself. Thank you. When you and I talked just now, I promised you employment. I have you a light? Yeah. My associates wish to determine how well you fit our requirements. To begin with, the eyes. The eyes are right. <laughs> Possibly the only feature that is. Where did you see the eyes of uh, the other? It was at Notre Dame de Kazan in 1915, when we had been pushed back by the Germans. She came into the church to pray with her mother, and they each placed a candle before the big icon. I saw two little candles reflected in her eyes. Blue eyes? Blue-grey, with two candle flames like a pair of golden dots. And just now, when I held the match for this one cigarette... There was the same thing exactly. And very few eyes will pick up a reflection like that. I'm an artist. I know what I'm talking about. What about the height? Huh? She looks too tall to me. Mm. Last time I held her stirrup at Saskoy, when she was reviewing our regiment, I noted that the top of her dolman was on the level of my eye. Uh, stand up, Fräulein. Mm. What did you say? I said stand up. Uh. <coughs> mm. Of course, she's 14 years older than the other was when she died. And I must remind you again that those 14 years would not have been what the first 18 were. Uh, go over there. I want to see how you walk. Very well. <coughs> oh, look at her. They were taught to walk carrying a book on their heads. <laughs> Another thing we'll have to tell our subscribers, she has somehow forgotten. Prince Boonin... Where is this resemblance that so impressed you? I don't see it. I don't see it at all. My dear Piotr, I should like to see your sweetheart of 20 years ago. Are you sure you might not pass her by in the street without recognising her? It's not the same thing. These subscribers of ours will not be hurrying by their minds on other matters. They'll be keyed up, expectant, critical, suspicious. And how have they seen the original? Hmm? A white-clad figure in a rapidly moving carriage or one of a family group in the flowered stand at Krasnoye, and then in the war period, with the linen headdress and grey skirts. Oh, yes, they saw quite a lot of her in the newspapers. What are the royal servants? There's still a few of them about. Oh, they'll see her through their tears, good, faithful souls that they are. And the family? Yes, more serious, certainly. But it isn't as if there were a mother or father to be dealt with, or a brother and sister's. True, there's quite a wealth of uncles, aunts and cousins, despite the Bolsheviks and their execution squads. But they refer secretly to their photographs, and as she will resemble those photographs... You surely don't believe you'll be able to convince the bankers? Well, there's a chance. If we could get the family to accept her, the bankers would find it difficult to question their endorsement. And another thing, look at her hands. What did you say? I said, look at her hands. You don't mean that... I told you there was a special feature. Oh. Something rather surprising. Come here. I said, come here. Here. <laughs> Open your hands. You'll find they're long and well-formed, with a scar in the middle. Let me see. Oh, yes. It's true. Now, look at her head, gentlemen. Huh? Yeah. Ah, the left temple. 
You see, a long, narrow depression, the path of a bullet. Thought it may be something more prosaic, a childhood accident, a rather bad one that caused a fracture. <laughs> what is this scar? Is it from a bullet? Tell us. I, I don't remember. Let me go. <laughs> you don't remember how you got a wound like that? Of course you do. You're lying. There are many things I have forgotten. Fräulein, you told one of the nuns that you were the daughter of Nicholas II. I was sick. When you're sick, you get crazy ideas. I, I could have told her other stories, just as romantic. Of the time I, I went to the land of the Samoyeds with the three professors, the old one and the two young ones. Oh, and when was this? When? I don't remember. There was a great glacier. We had to chip the ice very carefully, and then the blocks were melted by the professors. In them were plants and strange creatures that lived on the earth ages and ages ago. We saw a butterfly that came alive and flew about in the sun. A butterfly that had lived for a million years and then died in a day. Hmm, I see you've been quite a reader, Fräulein. But I also see something else. You're an actress. And an actress is what we want. You... You wish me to pretend that the story I tell the little nun is true? Exactly. The little nun was simple and trusting. Yes, I agree. This will not be so easy. You'll have to meet friends and, and perhaps even some of the family. Would they own me? They might, might tell me that they never saw me before. They don't know who I am. That would be dreadful. You know about the family, do you? I wrote a letter once and there was no... Oh, but... You're not talking about my family, are you? You're speaking of this princess. Well, it might suit her family to accept you. <laughs> you might be the key that would unlock doors for them. The doors of the bank vaults. <laughs> Give me another cigarette. There you are. Here. Do you really think the Romanovs might endorse her? Yes, some of them. Yes, I think that if it were managed very tactfully... But... Who would carry the most weight? The most weight? Oh, <laughs> no question about that. The old icon. The old icon? Yes, that's what we used to call her. Marie Fyodorovna. Uh, the Tsar's mother. People say she went mad. Well, she happens to be here in Germany, visiting her grandnephew Paul. What of him? The prince you say she's visiting, Prince Paul. Yes. I wonder. You know, he was her future husband. Anastasius? Was he? Yeah, everyone at court took it as an accepted fact. The two had been playmates from childhood, second cousins. Well, surely this Prince Paul would be the hardest to convince. He was in love with the girl. Or was he? Oh, royalty, who can say? It was a great match for him. Aside from any question of rank, the Tsar was the richest man in the world. Yes. Yes, the more I consider it, the more I think we ought to try it. Paul is poor and a playboy. That huge fortune that's waiting in the banks could count a lot with him. But surely the only way he'd get the money. Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't think he'd be willing to marry that creature? <laughs> well, I admit it sounds pretty far-fetched. It would depend, I suppose, on how hard up he is. No. What? what do you mean, no? I want to go. Go where? Anywhere, back to the nuns. I want to go. Let Did me go. Stop. <laughs> Fräulein, don't you want to be a royal princess? And wear a coronet and have people kneel and... Kiss your hand. I think I must still be in the asylum with the woman who believes she's an angel and, and the three who sit crouched and covered all day because they've not yet been born. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you are right. <laughs> Here you are with the mad prince, the mad painter and the mad banker. Only the banker is not quite so mad. You expect her to learn the names of half a dozen palaces, each with its servants and officials, the regiments who guarded them, tutors, title friends, court procedure, all in one week. Quite a task for a woman with a bad memory. Oh, she'll naturally make mistakes. But the lapse of time will excuse her. That and her head wound. 
I doubt if she even knows how to behave among people of our class. Our class? Oh, cheer love. You and the Grand Dukes, eh? <laughs> Still all right. We must start teaching her at once. Uh, Petrovsky, hand me that album of family photographs. Uh, here you are. Now, Fräulein. King of Norway, Uncle Hans, mm -hmm. the old King of England, Uncle Bertie, the Queen of Norway, Aunt Swan. Mm. Good. Excellent. Now, your escape. Who was it rescued you on the night of the assassination at Ekaterinburg? Two brothers named Moscovoy. And they took you across the Romanian frontier at what place? Balta. Mm. And from there to Bucharest, where where you found me and sent me to a sanatorium in Switzerland. There, Chernoff. What have you to say to that? Uh, is that all? That's enough for the present. Now, let's practice your posture, your walk. Uh, where's that gramophone record? Uh, Piotr, will you wind up the machine? Yes, of course. Now, Anna, uh, go up those <laughs> stairs. Now, those are the steps of the Winter Palace. Try to picture it. The long line of the Imperial Guard. Your father, the Emperor, in uniform at their head. Behind you on a balcony are your mother, your sisters, and your brother, Alexis. The mass bands strike up, God protect the Tsar. Now, Piotr. Yes. Now that's your signal. You come down. Splendid. I believe she can do it. Yes, yes. Now, let me present the members of your household. Boris Chernoff, formerly of St. Petersburg, banker. Your Highness. Pyotr Konstantinovich Petrovsky, artist, formerly in scenic department of Russian Imperial Opera. Your Highness. And I am Prince Arkady Arkadyevich Bunin, general of the Don Cossacks. Ex de camp attached to the person of His Imperial Majesty Nicholas II, Emperor of all the Russias. And I, I am Her Imperial Highness, Princess Anastasia Nikolaevna. You've done a good job, Petrovsky. <laughs> this really begins to look like a house where a princess is installed. Yeah. <laughs> I like the chandelier hmm? and the icon. Yes. It's quite like the old days of the opera. <laughs> mm, there are four more witnesses on today's list. Are they still here? One had to go, um, a dressmaker. Yeah? That's a girl. She says she worked for the firm who made clothes for the four princesses. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, Sonia Rykov. She'll be back tomorrow. Good afternoon, comrades. How's it going? Good afternoon, Excellency. I've got some news. We are about to have a distinguished visitor. Oh? Uh? Maria Fyodorovna. No, the Dowager Empress, here, in Berlin. Yes, it's official. Prince Paul sent for me to ask if Her Highness was now well enough for us to bring her to Heraldeberg to meet the Empress. Well, I thought we weren't ready for that. Not yet. So I said no. Mm, you're quite right, but I'm The not prince sure. said in that case Her Majesty will visit Her Highness under my escort. Of course, there was nothing I could reply to that, except that I was sure Her Highness would be overjoyed. Were those his exact words that you quoted? Did he say Her Highness? He did, indeed. No talk of the unknown woman or the alleged daughter of the Tsar, the sort of phrases he used before he met it her. It sounds as if she convinced him. She's amazing. What she's managed to learn in one month. Well, it is just a month, isn't it? Twenty-eight days. It's uncanny. Yes. 
except for one glaring failure. What? There must be an interpreter present if she speaks to a witness who can only speak Russian. Yes. It's the reason she failed with old Pluvich, the Chamberlain. Well, Pluvich won't matter. If only the old icon accepts her. Everything depends on that. Mightn't it be enough if the prince is convinced? Well, the prince counts for very little. The society idler. Bit of a gigolo, musician, dreamer. Above all, a Russian. But the empress is a Dane. There's no romantic nonsense about her. No. What time will they be here? Four o'clock. We'd better have the other witnesses in at once. Mm. Sergei! Excellency. Ask Her Highness to be ready to receive the witnesses. Very good, Your Excellency. Uh, shall I bring them in? Oh, one moment. Who are they? A sleigh driver who appears to be blind, a shabby-looking doctor, and some sort of charwoman. Oh, well, their names may help to swell the list of supporters. Do they all speak German? Sergei? Uh, yes, Excellency. The woman and the old man have been living here for some time. And the doctor? He, he speaks it well enough. Mm. One at a time, Sergei. The woman first. Uh, the blind man and the woman are friends. They ask if they may come together. Oh, very well. <clears throat> come this way. Excuse me, Your Excellency. Now, my good people, Her Royal Highness is about to receive you. Oh. You are to talk to her and examine her attentively. After the audience, you will be taken to the Chief Secretary, who will register your opinion in writing and obtain your signature. Her Imperial Highness, Anastasia Nikolaevna. Good afternoon. Oh. oh, yes, it is you, little mother. I know you as my dog knows me. You were like four flowers, you and your sisters, and for each of you, there was a different scent. Dear Vasyevich, do you remember that Christmas at Gatchina when I had sprained my ankle on the ice and you had to carry me to and from your sleigh in your arms? Oh, yes. It is your voice. I do it anywhere. My sister Olga took a photograph of us, you and me. I have it in an album. Would you like to see it? I am blind, gracious one. Oh. I didn't know. You would be glad of your eyes today. Our princess is beautiful. <laughs> you have knelt to me long enough, Vasyevich. It was not like that at Gatchina. Then we threw snowballs at each other. <laughs> you, you loved the snow. <laughs> I called you Snow Princess. And you said you, you liked the name. Sergei, place chairs for my visitors. Ooh. I must inform your highness that other visitors are coming. Yes. Prince Paul and the Dowager Empress. <gasps> she is coming here? Yes. I, I, I don't know if I will be able to face her. Must it be today? Yes, it must. I'll send the peasants away. Then you can lie down and rest. No. No, they've been waiting a long time. Sergei, bring the chairs. Highness. Sit here. Oh. Oh. Uh, oh. Now, what is your name? Anushka, Highness. And have you come here all the way from Russia, Anushka? No, Highness. I have worked here in the Russian colony for 11 years, since 1921. You know me, do you, Anushka? Of course I know you, little mother. Where was it that I met you? In Peterhof? Or Lavadia? Or, or was it in Spala during the war? Katerine Burke, little mother. Oh. The assassin, Yubrovsky, ordered me to scrub the floors. Katerine Burke. I 
Do you remember the swish of cloth as you wiped the floors? One of the soldiers had traced on the floor a sketch of Rasputin, all naked. I washed it out. And as I did so, the sun must have come out. For a little beam came through the shutters. And there on the floor was your shadow. I stooped and kissed it. And afterwards, in that dreadful day when the shots were heard and the sun darkened so that a July evening seemed like the blackest hour of winter. But even then, at that time, it was whispered that there was one who was not dead. All right, that's enough. You were brought here to attest that this is indeed Anastasia Nikolaevna. You both agree? In... Ekaterinburg, there is a deep wood of pine trees, and in it the night shadows are seen moving. Some say seven, but I know now there can only be six. <laughs> Goodbye, dear Vasyevich, and God's blessing. <laughs> Goodbye, Anushka. Anushka of Ekaterinburg. Bless you. Bless you, Highness. This way. Oh, thank heaven. I'm dying for a cigarette. How dare you! you light a cigarette in my presence without my permission? I beg your highness's pardon. I'll put it out at once. Good. Most effective. And does that mean that your illusion has returned? Or is it self-hypnotism? A cigarette, please. <laughs> Here you are. Here. Have I, Your Highness's permission to smoke? If you must. <laughs> you managed to capture just the right tone. If you're as good with the old Empress as you were with those two servants, the prize is in sight. Yes. The conspiracy seems to be prospering. The Tsar sent a huge sum to England and Sweden to buy munitions, but most of that's gone, spent in buying guns that arrived too late. But in addition to that, he deposited in those same banks two million pounds for each of his children. Ten million pounds, which now belong to his only surviving daughter, to you. I don't want to talk about money or your schemes for getting it. She is coming, the Empress Grandmother. Pardon, Your Highness, what of the last witness... Who is it? Uh, the doctor. He has been waiting a long time. I'm sure the <gasps> princess... <laughs> you can't come in here. Sergei, that will do. You may leave us. Highness. Her Highness can grant you only a very brief interview. She is expecting some important visitors and so is preoccupied. Yes, so I see. What is your name? Mikhail Syriensky. I'm a doctor. And where was it that you met, Her Highness? In the hospital. Not one that she visited in the war? No. One in which we were both patients. Both patients? Where was this? In Bucharest. We used to sit in the big sunroom together. Her head had been hurt in a factory explosion. We became great friends. You're a Bolshevik agent. They sent him to upset Her Highness's claim. You know she is not a Highness as well as I do. Aren't you going to speak to me, Anna? It is a year since we met, since you ran away. Keep your eyes on me, you Bolshevik dog. I'm talking to you. I am not a Bolshevik and I am not their emissary. I have been lonely since you left, Anna. Excuse me. Oh, I see. A royal gesture of dismissal. You should be ashamed, Prince Boonin. Go. Be careful. I have her police papers, papers that establish her identity as Anna Brune. Oh, police papers mean nothing. 
They're being forged every day. Go, or I'll have my servants kick you down the steps. I am going. And don't come back, or you will be sorry. I was for a year in the hands of the secret police. After that, what any man can do to me is nothing. Get out! See him off the premises, Fjord. Come along. Goodbye, Anna. If you should want me, I'm at a small hotel called Potsdam. So, Anna, and is all this true? Were you the mistress of that scarecrow? If I were, would it be any business of yours? I want the truth. Was that man your lover? Let me go. Don't forget, the success or failure of your precious swindle is in my hands. Now, gentlemen, if I am to continue with your plans, I must go and get ready to meet the Empress Grandmama. Turn off. Go after her. Keep an eye on her. Yes, Excellency. Excellency! Excellency! What is it, Sergei? Excellency! The Empress! The Empress! She's here! Already? So, this is the audience room. Her Imperial Majesty and the Baroness Liebenbaum. Arkady Arkadyevich, I thought you were dead. Don't they shoot traitors nowadays? That will be all, Sergei. Excellency. Let your majesty be reassured. The tradition has been observed. I was sentenced to be shot twice. By whom? The whites or the reds? By both. And you're still here. But there, I remember, you were always a man who, when you came to a parting of the ways, took both ways. My compliments, Brunine. You're a scoundrel on a grand scale. Either that or possibly a loyal servitor of a princess too long denied her rightful heritage. Even by my smelling salt. Your Majesty. I remember one of your mistresses from the Mariinsky Theatre. You went in for actresses even in those days. She was French, if I remember rightly. Wore dresses made by Dracol and had eyes like a mourning letter. She created a scandal in your rooms and my husband called you to account. She conveniently disappeared. You made women disappear in those days and now you make them appear. Quite a talented magician. The princess asked your majesty to grant her an interview at which you might judge, better than anyone living, the truth of her claim. She had relied, as had we, on your coming with an open mind. My dear Boonich, I have already been shown two Alexis, one Olga and a Mary. I am a little weary of these spectral Romanova. Your Majesty must surely realise that this time there is a difference. From the very beginning, there have been persistent rumours of the Princess Anastasia's survival. And these stories were sufficiently plausible for a group of our Russian kinsmen to subscribe a fund to be used in making a search. With yourself as searcher-in-chief, the whole thing reeks of money, Boonin. Well, there is certainly money at stake. The contribution that's Tsar made to support the war effort... The Kremlin has laid claim to it. Yes, I know all about that. My son was ready to beggar himself in the defence of his country. Unfortunately, he waited, as usual, until it was too late. True. The Tsar was like a man riding with his back to the engine on a train. He never saw anything until he was past it. As to these foreign funds of his... I am not here to spoil your little game, though I am not here to help it either. I have come, if you must know, because my nephew has plagued me into it. I am grateful to his highness. But I warn you, don't try my patience too far. I have lost everything that I have ever loved. I have nothing left but my memories. Don't lay your hands on those. They are sacred. 
Now you may go. Thank you. Your Your Majesty, uh, Yes? I... Yes? Or perhaps you are afraid to let your artiste perform without a prompter? Not at all. I will go and tell Her Highness you are ready to receive her. I think Your Majesty is about to meet with some surprises. Impudence. You know Liebenbaum? Yes, Your Majesty. Uh, it's when I meet a man like Bunin that I understand why the revolution happened. Uh. His Highness Prince Paul. You're here before me. I'm so sorry, Great Aunt. <laughs> you have discarded that old chestnut about punctuality being the politeness of princes? I had to borrow a car. It's a nuisance not having one of one's own. I'm afraid your ancestors hadn't foreseen a world in which royalty might have to work for a living. Hasn't anyone received you? Oh, yes. The Kerensky satellite was here. He succeeded in... in rousing a nausea in me. The Bunin of 1918 and the Bunin of today are two different men. You think people change? How naive you are. My husband used to say, if you want to reform a man, start with his grandfather. <laughs> Run along, Liebenbaum. Run along, we're discussing family matters. Oh, I'm not to see her. You'd only insist on giving me your opinion, and you're never right about anything. Your Majesty. <laughs> Does Anastasia know you're here? I believe the lady has been notified. Do try and keep your mind open. Don't make up your mind before you meet her. Your gullible Paul. You always were. You had reached your teens before you stopped believing in Santa Claus. Oh, I didn't recognize her immediately. One hadn't made enough allowance for the years, or for all that she had gone through. Oh, she answered your questions, I suppose. Now, what do you expect? Bunin has taught her her lessons. Bunin doesn't know everything. There are many sources he can draw on here in Berlin. Old friends, old servants... Ghosts from our royal past, each with his stock of personal anecdote. It isn't only what she knows, and it isn't the evidence of her wounds. No, it's more a, an atmosphere she creates, a quiet assurance, a fineness that you feel is above question. Hmm. You sound as if you've fallen in love with her. I think perhaps I have. You're quite mad. Yes, I suppose it's only to be expected your poor mother when her husband died, wanted to marry the Pope. <laughs> she was always religiously inclined? It's no laughing matter, Paul. No, if you're in love with this, this sleeping beauty... Well, shouldn't I be? Don't forget she was to have been my wife. Why, we actually went through a ceremony of our own devising, a child betrothal. It was held on the Chinese island. She was 12 and I was 14. And does she recollect it all clearly? Who was with you? What she wore? Now that's the thing a woman remembers the longest. She hasn't mentioned anything about it. It seems to be one of her blank spots. She doesn't remember a thing like that. And you still believe in her? Oh, preposterous. You're wrong. I've spoken to the doctors, to Lessing for one. There's no greater authority. He says some degree of amnesia would be almost inevitable. The head wound was a serious one. Bunin tells me that at times the poor dear has complete lapses of memory. Bunin? The girl's nothing to him or to his friend. She's simply a means of getting their hands on the millions my son deposited in foreign banks. Shouldn't we, too, give some thought to those millions? Money means power, and one day a crisis may arise in Russia. A political crisis? Don't delude yourself, Paul. The ants are in power, the red ants... Perhaps you are right, but the blood of those poor murdered innocents cries out for justice. Your sweet girls, a little boy. Leave them. Leave them, Paul. Wrapped in the dignity of death. 
undisturbed by controversy or upstart claimants. Uh, Imperial Highness. Ah, there she is. Anastasia, my dear, are you feeling better today? Yes, thank you. My cold is almost gone at last. Dressed like that, you make the past come alive. Oh, dear, oh, dear, the pathos of distance. But I won't talk about it now. This is your grandmama's moment. Have confidence. I will leave you together, Anastasia. Great aunt. Yes. I can see why the others have believed, especially my romantic-minded nephew, the likeness is good enough for a waxwork gallery. I haven't cared whether they recognise me or not. But you... Don't you know me? Where were you born? In Peterhof. Child, no doubt, of Nicholas II and Alexandra, his empress. And grandchild of Mary Fyodorovna. You have taken a long time in coming to comfort my bereavement. For many years I didn't know who I was. But now you are quite sure. How long have you been an actress? As in your case, Your Majesty, from earliest childhood. Yes, to be a princess is to be an actress, but not necessarily a good one. Perhaps I should have learned to be a better one if the curtain hadn't fallen so early. You are flippant about a subject which you must realise is, for me, a great personal sorrow. Forgive me. I forgot for a moment you would be regarding that tragedy as more yours than mine. I am trying to keep my courage, but you're making it very hard for me. I have been without love for so long. Oh, come. Come, have there been no men in your life? I thought the story of your rescue included a Bolshevik guard who had fallen in love with you and who carried you from the charnel house where the bodies were awaiting burial. Yes, he rescued me and he took me to Romania. But he soon decided that a crazy girl was no great prize. A rescue from the very edge of the grave, years of lost memory in an asylum. Oh, excellent material for melodrama. Long, empty days. The consciousness of living came only through pain. Hardly melodrama, Grandmama. Did I give you permission to call me that name? I'm sorry, it slipped out. You think my answer should be to grant you that privilege? A lonely old woman should be glad to hear someone call her grandmama, glad to clasp a young head against her empty bosom. My loneliness has been as bitter as yours. You ask me for recognition for love, and you do it very well. Your eyes are moist, your voice is full of feeling. But I can only reply that the love you beg for belongs to one who is dead. Now, you have chosen to deck yourself in the robes of a spectre, mademoiselle, and so doing, have managed to win endorsement from a few poor sentimentalists, dreamers, self-deceivers. But I am none of those things. I was told you would ask me difficult questions, but you're not interested enough to ask me any. Oh, I was going to catechise you, was I? And this is what your business associates told you? They mean nothing to me, these men. Neither they nor the millions about which they dream. But they have told you about those millions. Oh, yes, they have told me. And did you not say that a Romanov may be butchered but is not to be bought? That should have been your answer. For if your blood was truly Romanov, you would not let yourself be made a cat's paw by Bunin and his crew. Tell me to whom this money should be given and I will give it. Oh. Then perhaps you will believe me. Easily said and rather clever. You cannot give the money away until you have it. And you cannot get it without first obtaining my recognition. 
I remember hearing Father say you were the toughest fighter the family has known since Peter the Great. That was at the time you and my mother quarrelled over a necklace, some emeralds. Part of the imperial treasure, but you wanted to keep them for your lifetime. Who told you this? I remember you wearing them. It was with your last court dress, the red velvet one with the long train. Oh, where did you see my portrait? Or did someone describe me? Strange, I only remember the large outlines, all the little details. My father took the side of my mother. They even brought in the Chancellor. They were all lined up against you. But you kept Figgy's jewels. You know that too, do you? And you've learned to call the great Catherine Figgy. <laughs> we always called her that. And sometimes we'd give the same nickname to Mary because she had such an <laughs> eye for the men. Olga used to tease Stop. her. Stop! Stop! I forbid it. I... F I forbid you to speak those names. They're my sisters. I can speak of them if I choose. Imposter! You call me that! Yes, and I want it stopped. If you have any decency, I demand that you end this masquerade. I will pay you. I will give you more than those blackguards will. Go away. Leave me. I am offering you money. Go away, please. Oh, you're giving up, are you? <sighs> so it wasn't enough to have suffered all that. The cellar. The asylum. The horror. The emptiness. It was also necessary that I should meet you again. Like this. Ah, the tragic scene of despair. You're forgetting nothing, are you, Mademoiselle? Say what you like. I'm no longer able to struggle. Oh, how can anyone who has suffered so much have so little heart for suffering? I'm sorry if your failure to win me over is such a cruel disappointment, Mademoiselle. Don't go. But you just told me. Not that. yet. I'll say nothing more about them, nothing to try and convince you. Then what do you want me for? Just a moment or two longer. Let me touch your dress. Let me put my hand for a moment in yours. No. Mademoiselle, no. no. Let me go. You called me little one. Malienkaya. It was your own oh. special name for me. Why? You used it for no one else. <laughs> Are you ill? <laughs> No. <laughs> no, just a cough. Nothing serious. I'm not bidding for sympathy. You have seen a doctor, Mademoiselle. Oh, on. yes, I'm well acquainted with doctors. But it is kind of you to ask. And I'm not, after all, surprised that you do not recognise me. I know I've changed very much indeed. Let me, let me go, please. I must go home. What is strange is that you have altered so little... You still seem to me as you did that day that my finger was pinched in your carriage door. And you told me to try not to cry. Because there were people there. And I was the daughter of an emperor. Oh, no, let me go. Look, it, it is still not quite straight, that finger. Or, or, or can't you see the difference from the others? I don't know how you know these things, but you're too clever for me. But please... Mademoiselle, I am an old woman and I have not the strength Very to, well, to be up. Very well, if you must. And you'll never come back, I know it. We have met once again after all these years. The only two left of our family. I will see you again, Mademoiselle, when my mind is clear. Now, I am, I am feeling upset. No, perhaps you'd better not come again. You are kind now. But later you will get your balance. You will say she is some sort of cheap little actress hired for money. And it is true, Grandmama, they did hire me for money. I was starving after I ran away from the asylum. I'd nowhere to go. I even went down the steps to the canal. Perhaps I should not have let him stop me. Goodbye, Mademoiselle. Tell the prince I didn't need him. I want to go alone. Goodbye, dear Grandmama. I will try not to be lonely or frightened. Frightened? Why did I say that? Where have I said those words before? Oh, yes. I remember. It 
was on board the standard. What? What? What did you say? I had waked and found a storm raging, the big waves breaking against the hull, and I cried out. And... And you came to my cabin. Malienkaya. 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 You've come from so far away. I've waited so long for you. No, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. Not at first. There is no need to tell me any more. I'm not going to cross-examine. You're warm, you're alive, and that is enough. I can stand no more now. Can't you hear how my old heart is thumping? Now, I, I must go. Don't be afraid. I shall come back. I need you. No. No. Don't go. Let go of my dress. Let go. No. Now that is what you used to do as a child. Now be sensible, Malienkaya. I'll go as I used to, talking to you as I left the side of your little bed. Now, we will go tomorrow... If you like, to my old palace in Finland. Yes, it's still there, still mine, though I've not seen it for years. There's a very old man there, a lamplighter, and each evening he goes from one room to another lighting the empty lamps until, for him, the great dark rooms are ablaze with light. The other servants take no notice. They realize that he is childish. And perhaps that is true of us all. And we are lighting dead lamps to illuminate a grandeur that is gone. Good night, Anastasia Nikolaevna. And please... If it should not be you, don't ever tell me. She has gone? Yes, Paul. She has gone. She has accepted you? Yes. That is splendid news. If the old empress recognizes you, so must everyone. Even yourself? Me? I was one of the first to come to your support. You know I have been in love with you since our childhood. My desire to marry you is as strong as ever. There was a Russian doctor here this afternoon who insists my idea that I am the Tsar's daughter is a childish illusion. What? But that is absurd. Suppose I say it's true. Suppose I tell you that these scars of mine are the result of an explosion in a Bucharest chemical factory where I was a worker. Would you still love me? It isn't true. Why are you I'd trying... I'd be the same woman. Except for a name. Or is your love the exclusive property of the girl with whom you used to walk, hand in hand, in the gardens at Starskoy, beside the lake with the black swans? Ah. That's better. What's <laughs> better? Only one who was there would know that the swans were black. <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. <laughs> the cloud leaves your brow because I remember that the swans were black. Hmm? Uh, there's a picture of them, my dear Paul, in one of Boonin's photograph albums. I'm supposed to have taken it myself. Do you think I did? Oh, no. Oh, think of it, Paul. Ten million pounds. It's a handsome dowry, you must admit. Oh, no. Worth marrying for. Worth the effort of stirring up those old romantic efforts. Oh, no, please. And worth it for me, too. <laughs> as Prince Boonin says, I not only get the money, but a Prince Charming as well. Quite a triumph for Anna Brun. <laughs> Anna Brun? <laughs> 
That scar is unquestionably a bullet wound. Unquestionably, Your Highness. I must get an ambulance. The Empress will wish her to be in the family's care. She's speaking in Russian. Olga. Tatiana. My shoes. Petrovsky, you've got an orchestra. Good, good. And the throne, where on earth did you get that? Uh, rented for the night from the property department of the opera. It's from Boris Goodenough. <laughs> <laughs> and how about the ballroom, the seating arrangement? I've given Sir Gay and Boris their instructions. The generals and the court dignitaries are to have the front seats. Good. Piotr, our fortunes are on the turn. We have two guests tonight more important than all the others. Who? Councillor Krefting and Count Schromberg. The heads of the Svenska Handel Bank. The Tsar Swedish bankers. Exactly. Oh. I spent an hour with them in their suite at the Adlon. They were most impressed. Oh. The old Danish empress still carries weight in Scandinavia. You know, I think I shall go to America. That's it's the only country left with a proper respect for wealth. Have you seen this newspaper? Chernoff, what is it? Dinash Asgab. Oh, let me see. Yes. Another of their veiled attacks? The veil is off. They call us swindlers. What? Oh, they do, do they? They'll pay for that. Will pay they? handsomely. <laughs> Will they? Wait till you've had a look at it. Let me see the... And the girl... By God! This is the work of that doctor friend of hers. Prince Boonin, it is most important that I... Oh. So you've seen it, have you? Councillor Drevenitz. Good evening. You're looking very handsome in your court attire. I am speaking of that paper, that article. Oh, it's the work of a Bolshevik agent. General Matov for the newspaper office. They say they have proof. Proof? Well, of course they have proof manufactured in the Kremlin. What does their proof amount to when weighed against the endorsement of a royal fiancé and an imperial grandmother? True, if they really are backing your Clemens. Well, of course they're backing her. As to this so-called well-informed writer, we intend to bring an action for heavy damages. Yes, indeed. Well, I will go back and stop General Martov from upsetting any more people. Oh, and that reminds me, I'm having trouble over the order of presentation. Is that your list? Well, give it to me and I'll look it over and advise you. Thank you, Prince. I wish you would. Uh, the orchestra will, I suppose, strike up the anthem the moment the royal party arrives? The orchestra has its instructions. Yes, of course. Good evening. My compliments, Prince. You have a gift for handling awkward situations. <laughs> The conspirators. Good evening, Imperial Highness. You wish to speak to me? Yes, you showed good judgment in coming on ahead of the others. There are matters to discuss. Oh? Did you make any slips while you were staying at Heraldeburg with the Empress? Slips? Mistakes? Blunders? I'm afraid I can't say. I was ill. In a delirium. There has been an attack in one of the evening papers. Yes, I saw it. The Empress showed it to me. She showed it to you? What did you say? Nothing. She merely watched my face as I read it. But her attitude towards you. Tell us about that. Her Majesty has shown me great kindness. Owing to her care, I am quite well again. The mists are gone. Well, she's bound to come. Well, it's her nephew's future to consider. 
Prince Paul will be here, of course. Yes, I think you can count on Prince Paul. But he's not enough. I've told you that before. They may say it's money he's after. I can imagine a lot of people will think that. On your dressing table, you'll find a list of the most important people whom you meet tonight, with some personal details jotted down against their names. I know you have a photographic memory. You speak of my memory. How good is your memory, I wonder, Prince Boonin? What do you mean? It was a lovely autumn morning at Krasnoy. There was a gymkhana. You helped me to mount and, holding my hand, said something too personal. I raised my riding whip. God. Was it I? If not, how did I learn it? Not from your books. Excuse me, gentlemen. But it's impossible. And yet, uh, how did she know? <laughs> the Empress told her, reminding of things the real Anastasia had repeated. Her Imperial Majesty. She's here. Thank heaven. Ah, oh, the entire syndicate. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. I think you had better give me my smelling bottle, Liefenbaum. Your Majesty. Your Majesty is early. I, may I offer that as my excuse for not being at the door? Save your apologies. Pomp without power only makes the pose royalty ridiculous. Is my nephew here? Not yet, Your Majesty. Petrovsky, go. People will be arriving. Yes, Excellency. You too, Chernoff. Yes, Excellency. You school your associates in the old traditions. Your overbearing manner is quite futile. And is it your idea to present a Romanov on a hired throne and one, unless I'm mistaken, made of papier-mâché? May I remind Your Majesty that the realities are now in a museum? Oh, yes. Our state robes are to be seen in London at Madame Tussauds' waxwork exhibition. I trust Her Highness will soon be able to provide herself with more suitable furnishings. You are thinking of my son's foreign deposits? Yes, I understand, Boonin. You've caused the princess to sign certain documents concerning these monies. Their handling and division. I admit the share we asked Her Highness to assign us may sound like rather a large one, but my two associates and I have taken a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble? <laughs> the impudence. Oh. And did you speak, Liebenbaum? Such a lot of old friends arriving. To think they're still alive. Quite a miracle. Only half alive, most of them. Countess Solinskaya. Yes. May I go and embrace her? Oh, go, go. Oh, go. Yes, go. Your Majesty. I assume from Your Majesty's attitude that the the princess has told you certain things. She told me nothing deliberately. But the night my nephew brought her to me, I sat by her bed for many hours. She was in a delirium? Yes. A delirium whose fires were very illuminating. The monstrous shapes of nightmares. Trembling hopes, black despairs... Wavering footsteps that led to a canal. A, a canal? A canal, where a poor broken creature met a cynical brute who bargained with her in the coinage of food and shelter. I see. Your Majesty knows. The whole dirty fraud. A fraud, Your Majesty? Yes. You planned a fraud, didn't you? What else do you call it? Oh, surely, Your Majesty, if my friends and I made an error in believing this girl's story, we, we can hardly be blamed. Well, you yourself accepted her as genuine. Just what I expected. As soon as you see that your Drosky is being overtaken, you throw your lady passenger to the wolves. I assure Your Majesty, it was she who asserted that she was the Tsar's daughter. I was merely asked my opinion as to the truth of the claim. And your nimble brain saw at once that here was a splendid chance of exploitation. Well, we may perhaps have been gullible, but... That, I think, is the worst. Oh, don't, don't try that mealy mouth stuff with me. It sickens me. May I ask, Your Majesty, why you have come here? If it is to denounce our... Uh, well, I, don't, I hardly know what to call her. Victim will do very nicely. Please, Your Majesty. My two friends and I merely endorsed an illusion. 
I'm sure the, the princess believes herself to be your granddaughter. Undoubtedly. And I have not come to denounce her. Oh. You can make of that what you will. I am deeply grateful. Might I hope that your majesty would extend her benevolence a little further? Now, you want my public acknowledgement? Well, think of your nephew. He will share in the Tsar's millions. Millions that may otherwise pass to your son's murderers. Oh, very cleverly put. As to her, <laughs> if we believed, if you yourself believed for a time, what harm is there in making others believe? Your endorsement would be a truly royal gesture. So, you ask for my support, whether I believe it or not. Without your majesty's help, I fear, I greatly fear... For once, you are not able to turn the winning trick. Oh, your majesty... You needn't reply. The audience is over, Arkady Arkadyevich Bunin. His Imperial Highness, Prince Paul. Ah, here you are. How are you, dear great aunt? Well, well, thank you. Good evening, your highness. Good evening, Bunin. What a gathering you've got out there. Where did they dig up all those diamond dog collars, those jeweled kolosniks? The princess is in there? Yes, your majesty. Then I will leave you. Great aunt. Is anything wrong? I'm afraid so. Her, her Majesty refuses us her support. But that is impossible. She has no doubts regarding Her Highness, none at all. She told you that? Yes, and her whole attitude. She displays real devotion. I just had a thought. The forthcoming marriage made a deep impression on those Swedish gentlemen. If you could decide when the wedding is to take place... And make an announcement. Tonight, you mean? Yes. You think the effect... Yes, I see. Uh, of course, Her Highness must be consulted. Yes, perhaps she'd better be told that you would like to speak with her. You needn't trouble, Prince Bunin. You have forgotten how well one can hear behind these doors. Good evening, Anastasia. Good evening, Paul. Her Majesty wishes to have a word with you when you are free. There is a rather important thing to be settled... Prince Paul would like to make an announcement tonight of your marriage date. I will discuss the matter with the prince in private. Certainly, if you wish it, Highness. Excuse me. A date for our marriage. You would like to name it at once? If you are agreeable. You feel it will impress the bankers? That is one thing, but the you other... You know, there is one thing you have never mentioned. Our boy and girl betrothal at Krasnoy, the ceremony on the Chinese island. I was waiting to see if you would remember. I thought you would be bound to speak of it, and you have. No one living could have told you of it because no one knew. Oh, no. You yourself. You told me the day you brought the Empress to see me. What? You spoke of it to her. I was standing behind those doors, listening. Oh, Paul. Supposing there were no bankers, no money, would you still be as sure that I am the girl to whom you pledged your love? Of course. Now it is I who ask for proofs. I suggest that we marry with no reference to bankers or bank accounts, that we make no claim for this money, that we work for our living, both of us. Oh. But why? Why should we? Poor people have one advantage, Paul. When they are loved, they know it is for themselves. I refuse to take that remark seriously. Hadn't you better go to Her Majesty? I have been taught that you shouldn't keep royalty waiting. Very well. <laughs> I hear that she is also in a difficult mood tonight. Good evening, Anna. Oh. How 
charming you look. And how well. How did you get in here, Mikhail? Through the entrance provided for the chauffeurs. Why are you staying on in Berlin? Away from your work, your experiments. Oh, if it is only to beg me to go back with you, you are wasting your time. No, I shall not go back to Bucharest. The shadow of the Kremlin falls ever more strongly across Eastern Europe. Here, too, in Berlin, sinister forces are at work. No, I must go to a country where the individual is not degraded, where I can be free to work as I will. I am glad. You have so much to give the world. I did not come tonight to speak of myself. I am afraid for you here in the hands of these unscrupulous men. They would stop at nothing. Mikhail, I told you things that didn't happen because I dared not remember what did. But now I have faced it to the last horror, to the death of those I loved. Dreams, Anna, dreams. Do you know why I ran away? Because you made me unsure. When you spoke with such conviction, I would say, perhaps Mikhail is right, perhaps there was a factory explosion in which my head was injured. There was. I remember when it happened. It was the day we arrived in Bucharest. Moscovoy saw that it was a likely excuse and took me to the hospital with a story that I was one of the factory workers. Then he and his brother went off with what remained of the jewels. Poor little Anna. No. No, you need not pity me any more. The mists are gone. Forever. My dear, we must... Who is this man, Anastasia? Paul, this is Dr. Siryensky. He is one of my guests. Paul, I want you and everyone to know that Dr. Siryensky is under my protection. These are my orders. Very good. I will tell them. He obeys you. They all obey me. You are quite safe. Who is he? A prince. Prince Paul. <gasps> and he accepts you? Yes. Oh, I am bewildered. Oh, is it then possible that it is I who have lived with an illusion? Perhaps I did not want your dream to be true, because it must take you from me. It, it doesn't matter to me that I am a princess. It <sighs> only matters that I am I that someone, even if, even if it be only one, should hold out their arms to welcome me back from death. Well, my dear, I have had my half hour alone with my thoughts. Now, that is what my husband always insisted upon before he would make a decision. There have been bad Romanovs, many of them, and he was a good one. Your Majesty, may I present Dr. Mikhail Siryensky? Your Majesty. Is this the Mikhail of whom you talked during your illness? I talked of him. Oh, yes. And one day, when the fever abated for a time, I asked you about him. University of Moscow. A bacteriologist? Yes. The Kremlin people tried to force you to work on the development of germ warfare. You refused. Correct? Quite correct, Your Majesty. Three... Exiles. Well, my thoughts have been very much with Russia just now. The wonderful forests. And the good Russian air. Yes. Bitter to the taste, with the smell of pines that the winds bring from the frozen forests of the north. Yes, yes, yes. And now I will go. Wait. Go out the back way. You will be safer. Thank you. Your Imperial Highness. Oh, between you and me, it will always be Mikhail and Anna. Your Majesty. Dosvidanya, Anna. That is the man who loves you. Yes. You should be getting into that beautiful dress... And I will give you these emeralds to wear. Oh, Figgy's emeralds. Oh, no. They are yours by right? You are very kind, but I don't want them. You've already given me so much. My sanity. My desire to live. And what is to happen after tonight? 
Mm, must you go with these men? Oh, no, that is finished. Listen to that music. Yes. All the old Russian airs, the past, mm. always the past. A lost dead world that has vanished forever. You can't blame them for wanting the old life back. It was strangely beautiful. Yes, the figures moved charmingly. They sang and danced, they made jokes. But behind them hung a painted backdrop of the final scene in their comedy. A cellar in a Katerinburg. I have tried to live as if that horror had never been. I have places set at the table for my dear ones, and I talk to them as if they were there. I know. And no one can blame you for living with your dear phantoms. But so much of my life, even from the beginning, has been spent in a shadow world. So, you will not return with me when I go home next week. I shall come to you again, dear Grandmama, but I want to work. I want to live. And who knows, perhaps I shall find the things out of which other women make their happiness. You talk as if we were parting. Perhaps... We shall not have a chance to be alone together for some little time. Perhaps. And now, go and get dressed. I shall walk by your side when you enter that room. I had a struggle with my silly pride, but it is put away in my pocket. Oh, no, keep your pride, dear, dear Empress Grandmama. That is what you used to call me. Now... It is only grand, Mama. If there had never been an empress before, they would have had to call you one. And now you must excuse me, my dearest grandmama. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. My dear Paul, we've won. The opposers are beaten. You've done wonderfully, Bonin. It's a complete triumph. When Anastasia enters, they'll fall on their knees, eh, Chernoff? The two Swedish bankers are ready to accept her. London can't hold back after that. Her Imperial Majesty... The Empress Mary! She's alone! That's my blood tingling. Yes. Uh, where is Anastasia? Isn't she ready? She is in her room. Your Highness. Uh, Sergei, please tell Her Highness to be as quick as possible. Her Highness has gone. Gone? Left here, you mean? Left this house? Yes, Excellency, she has gone. She must be found and brought back. It will do you no good to go after her. Did she tell you where she was going? No. But I knew. She must be ill, another of her attacks. Where has she gone? In search of reality. That doctor? Possibly. I don't know. But the bankers. Ten million pounds. Ten million. An impressive sum, but one for which she may not have cared to barter her liberty. I am going home. Leave and bow. Give me your arm. Yes, Your Majesty. But what of me? You wanted her as she was, Paul. Keep her as she was. A yellowing photograph of a girl in a white piquet dress waving goodbye from the bridge of the Chinese island. Well, 
The mad Romanovs have come to a fitting end. Starring in Anastasia were Wendy Hiller as the Empress, Rosalind Shanks as Anna, and Alan Wheatley as Prince Boonin. Petrovsky was played by Anthony Daniels, Chernoff, Lockwood West, Prince Paul, Sean Barrett, Drivenitz, Ronald Batterley, Dr. Siriensky, Stuart Organ, and Baroness Lievenbaum, Maddie Head. The charwoman, Jean Trend, the sleigh driver, Hugh Dixon, and Sergei, Stephen Thorne. Anastasia by Marcel Moret was translated by Guy Bolton and adapted for radio by John Scottney. The director was Graham Gold. <laughs>